Well, we might start. Um, we're one minute past. People are still coming in. Um, but I'd just like to say welcome, everyone. Kia ora. Hello. Uh, my name is Janet. I'm the Senior Project Officer for Open Access Australasia. And this is the second of our three events for Open Access Week 2024. Really, really glad you're all. I'd like to um, begin just with uh, acknowledgement of country. Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We also pay our respects to all Indigenous people wherever they are in the world, particularly including the Na'uimari, the Tagata Whenua of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm calling in today from Gimoy, Cairns, in far north Queensland, on the land of the um, Yidinji people, and to the north I have the Jabagai and Damji people, and um, you're very welcome to post in the chat um, where you're calling in from as we carry on. With this beginning, I'd like to introduce um, Sophie Baker now to do an opening karakia. Um, Sophie is part of our OA Week 2024 planning committee, and she's also the scholarly communications librarian at Auckland University of Technology. Thank you, Sophie. Tu tau mai i runga, tu tau mai i raro, tu tau mai i roto, tu tau mai i waho. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora ki te katoa, haumie, uie, tai ki e. Thank you, Sophie. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session is being recorded. and uh, We will be sharing it under a CC BY license uh, after the fact. Um, please keep your microphone muted and um, the chat will be running continuously if you want to make comments or there's usually a little side discussion often goes on in the chat in these kind of events. Um, we would ask that you use the Slido for questions just so that we can easily see questions versus commentary. Um, if you put them in the chat, we might miss them is all. So there will be a direct link to a Slido that will be posted in the chat continuously throughout. So if you want to just click on that over there, and put in your questions. Um, we will be having plenty of time for questions at the end of the session. So what I'd like to do now is uh, I have a co-chair, co-facilitator for this session today. I'm very happy to introduce Lily Ho. Uh, Lily's the chair of the IFLA Action and Collection Development Section and a member of the Open Science and Scholarship Advisory Committee. In her regular position, she's the Assistant Director of Collections and Content at Library and Archives Northern Territory. Uh, currently, she's on a secondment at the Northern Territory Geological Survey, where she oversees the Information Centre and editorial teams. So Lily and I are going to kind of pass back and forth through the session today. She's going to be facilitating the first half of the session. And I will come back and see you for some questions for the panelists in a little while. Thanks, over to you, Lily. Thank you, Janet. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to join uh, this session. In the next one and a half hour will be the panelist presentation. And today's session, we have four speakers from Oceania and South Africa. They are Virginia Waju, Director of Research and Learning um, services at the University of Cape Town Library. So he has been in academic library for more than 25 years. He is the author of peer reviewed international publication. His research focus is on research librarianship with open access and library publishing. We, currently, Virgin is the chair of scholarly publishing and academic resource coalition. Africa and is driving the social justice agenda of open access for Africa. She is also the editorial board member of Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication and South African Journal of Libraries and Information Science. Our second speaker is Lumen Hay. 
So Lumen Hayes, Lumen Hayes is the Research Services Senior Manager at Auckland University of Technology. He, in prior to this current position, he helped to um, establish and coordinate AUT Library Scholarly Communication Services, a Diamond Open Access host hosting services. Lumen has been active in advocating for sustainable community lead solutions for equitable access to this stimulation of research. He is also the member of editorial board member of Journal of Library Librarianship and Scholarly Communication, and as a governance board member of Toha Toha, a formerly community. Former, formerly Creative Common New Zealand. Our first speaker is Tracy Quay, um, <clears throat> Academic Journal Manager, Queensland University of Technology. She manages a number of diamond open access peer review journal, uh, peer review scholarly journal. Tracy is also the managing editor of the Student Success Journal. A diamond journal now supported by the University of Southern Queensland Library. Tracy is co convener of the Liu Australian Scholarly Communication Community of Practice Diamond Journal Publishing Subgroup. Our last two speakers are Lindo Hostin and Korichi Inoru. Um, <clears throat> Lindo is the faculty member of Charles Sturt University. She involved in advocating and participating open access initiative. Prior to April this year, Lindo worked for Massachusetts University Library as a subject librarian with a strong interest in open access. She is part of the open access toolkit and other open access initiative. Koichi is a research service librarian at the Victoria University of Wellington. <clears throat> In this position, he provides researchers advice on the open access public publishing, researcher profile and strategy publishing to increase the reach and visibility of their work. He is a member of Council of New Zealand University Library Open Access. Now I hand over to Wiji, Director of Research and Learning Services at the University of Cape Town Library. Wiji, please. Wiji, please. Hello, Eugene. Hi, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I apologize for one second. There was um. Okay, yeah, can I share? I hope you can see my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, um, and, and thank you, Janet, for the invitation uh, to share this morning. Um, good morning to everybody. Um, before I explore the characterizations of Diamond Open Access, I would like to provide some context give a brief definition of diamond open access and then get into the, the, the characterizations. There are many who have stated that the open access movement has been around for more than two decades. So the question is, what has changed? I have stated at a number of different forums and in a number of publications, that the open access movement has betrayed Africa. Hence, there is a need, in my opinion, to return 
to the 2002 Budapest Open Access in Initiative and its philanthropic principles, and that is to share scholarship for the betterment of society. There is an explicit commitment in the declaration for the bi-directional flow of information. So we're talking about sharing the learning of the rich with the poor and the poor with the rich. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the movement has been blindsided by the publishers who have hijacked this philanthropic movement to maximize profits. The principles of double dipping, here I'm speaking about charging APCs on the back of traditional subscriptions. This double uh, dipping has further marginalized Global South scholarship. For Africans, the hope that the movement brought soon changed to despair. And as quickly, that despair spiraled into betrayal. Even the architects of the movement had succumbed to the adoption of the model in the quest for an acceleration to open. The end result is a shift from geographic colonialism to knowledge colonialism. We now, with this shift, we now have a second chance with diamond open access to ensure the decolonization of knowledge. Unfortunately, diamond cannot be seen as an enabler to the current commercial model. It has to be seen as a disruptor, a disruptor that will lead to an inclusive and equitable publishing ecosystem. The principles of social justice and non-commercialization must be, it has to be at the epicenter of diamond open access. Diamond open access can be defined as a scholarly publishing model where scholarship is free to the reader as well as to author. Simply put, there are no article or book publishing, book processing charges, and there are no subscriptions or purchasing costs. However, there are nuances that gives Diamond its distinctive characterization, and, uh, and that makes provision for contextual flexibility to foster relevance resulting in equity and inclusion. In Africa, we say every, knowledge, every village knows how best to tend to its own fires. These three distinctive characteristics are social justice, non-commercialization, and equity and inclusivity. When we're talking about social justice, for us, for Africa, diamond open access has to be underpinned. It has to be underpinned by social justice principles. It is these social justice principles that will deconstruct historical barriers and then reconstruct a publishing ecosystem that advances decolonization and demarginalization. A denorthernized publishing ecosystem will deconstruct, it will deconstruct systemic biases such as geographic bias, language bias, editorial and peer review bias, including and then the financial bias. In this social justice driven open access, the focus is on the democratization of knowledge, uh, through, uh, democratization of knowledge, production, and access. 
There are many diamond open access journals which are managed by academic communities, institutions, or nonprofit organizations rather than commercial entities. This model decentralizes the control over scholarly publishing, preventing, preventing the monopolization of knowledge by large commercial publishers. It enables the academy to take back its scholarship. Social justice, under, social justice principles amplifies voices that are often excluded from mainstream academic publishing due to financial constraints. Diamond Open Access must explicitly, it has to explicitly denounce profit-driven motives. <clears throat> In this context, it is about ensuring that scholarly communication is driven. It is driven by academic values rather than commercial interests. Non-commercialization embodies the principles of making knowledge freely available. The goal is to make scholarship more accessible, equitable, and is driven by the needs of the, of the, of the academy rather than profit. Diamond Open Access promotes equity, and for us, equity comes before equality, meaning that there is there has to be some level of prioritization in the distribution of resources and opportunities based on needs and circumstances before the sameness in treatment. The idea is that true equality can only be achieved when differing starting points, barriers, and challenges are acknowledged and addressed. By leveling the playing field, the gap between the haves and the have-nots have is closed, giving greater meaning and value to equality. The synergy between diamond open access and the principles of equity and inclusivity is evident in their shared goals of removing barriers to participation, promoting diverse voices, and ensuring that all scholars, all scholars, regardless of their geographic or financial situations, all of them contribute to and benefit from academic knowledge. By fostering a more equitable and inclusive academic environment, Diamond Open Access is a crucial role in advancing social justice within the global scholarly community. Diamond Open Access is not about the money. It is about equity and inclusion. It is about deconstructing historical exclusionary practices. As you can see from the graphic, that which is below the waterline are all of the challenges that need to be navigated by authors in the global south before they can even surface to address the issue of finance and air and, 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 and copyright. Social justice, non-commercialization, and equity and inclusion must, it has to be, it has to underpin free to the reader and free to the author. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Eugene. Our next speaker is Lumen Hay, Research Service Senior Manager at the University, Auckland University of Technology. Lumen, please. Uh, Reggie, that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much. No horia, no inarani, no airani, okutipuna, ifano mai ho, itamiki makoro, kuluk man hais taku ingoa, ku taku turanga mahi kitewananga aranui utamiki makoro. 
Uh, my name is Lukman. Um, I look after the research services team here at AUT. Um, and what I said at the beginning there was that my ancestors come from different parts of the world, um, from Georgia in Eastern Europe, from Ireland and England. Uh, I myself was born here in Tamaki Makoto. Uh, and AUT is situated um, on the Fenua, which is connected to the iwi uh, Nati Fatua or Are Oraki. I'm just going to share my screen now. And hopefully with some success. Okay. So, um, how do I follow Reggie? <laughs> hopefully, um, the same level of um, potency and um, and passion. Um, I've been thinking about this thing, community and uh, commercialization, community and commercialization, and what it actually means, and which communities we're talking about when we um, talk about in this context of open access. You know, how do we get to the point where community really is prioritized over revenue and profit making, and where it leads to and determines academic publishing? and is representative of its diversity. Um, we're faced with extraordinary and ongoing threats to existence. The results and the ongoing impact of colonization, the planet and climate change, extremes of poverty and wealth, attacks on indigenous people, the rise of fascism and its links to elite wealth and power. Um, and we're talking here about access to research and we're framing it in terms where there is some kind of binary assumption about which way we get to somehow equally choose or which way publishing gets to happen. The truth is, in our current system, there really is only one way. So I'm here to talk about diamond open publishing and open infrastructure and the ways to support it. Diamond open access just as Reggie's been talking about, has huge benefits. But to what extent can it actually tip the balance from commercialization to community? Just give me a minute while I flip around with the mouse. There we go. So, for those of you who don't know too far, um, this is one page from our, um, our website, and I encourage you to go and explore. The site itself at tufera.aut.ac.nz. Um, now, Diamond Open Journal's hosting service is just part of what we do um, under the banner of open research. We've been doing journal hosting since 2016. In its own way, it's been hugely successful and it represents many of the best aspects of small scale community led publishing. Um, the here, uh, my colleague Craig and I interviewed a number of our Tufa editors for an article which will be soon published in the Journal of uh, Librarianship and Global Communication. The article explores the experiences of those editors in running um, the APC free publications on our um, Open Journal Systems platform. The interviews highlighted so much of the value of Diamond Open Access, things that it enables, such as the opportunity for new and emerging researchers providing mentoring opportunities in a supportive environment, and the possibilities of bringing marginalized research into the center, or rather giving it some amplification. The fact that the cost is absorbed by the institution, so authors don't pay and readers don't pay. Um, and there's a diversity of offering, of, of format, of platform, and and this obviously contributes to uh, bigger diversity in its truest sense. Our system runs on open source software, so it connects with the community that in itself uh, works on the basis of reciprocity and sharing. The platform and the publications link research with the practitioners, so there is real world quite traceable impacts it generates conversation and reduces the perceived barriers between the research institution and community or the public. It works for the benefit of knowledge, of discourse and discovery, and not to generate profit. 
the uh, collective rather than individual benefits, but it's precarious. There are constraints on time. Uh, authors and editors, and editors in particular, under, undertake quite huge personal cost and sacrifice, which means working through holidays and weekends to keep their publications going. Um, they have to pick up all the onerous tasks like copy editing and layouts and proofing in between teaching and doing their own research as academics on a full-time basis. And this obviously has limits and it impacts the, their opportunities to grow and to promote their own publications. Cyber access titles are sometimes unacknowledged, particularly around performance reviews, not regarded with particular, particularly high esteem by colleagues or the wider academic system, which we know has been sold on the trick of prestige and ranking. Um, but there are also limitations because of the size of the team that supports um, our journal hosting service. We're a small team. Um, and as a result of those limitations, not every technical or customization can be can be supported. Not, not every development can be um, seen through in a timely manner. This can afford it can affect things like being able to support additional languages or um, aspects of accessibility and look and feel. But services like two that are crucial. They're small. They're actually, of course, dwarfed by the absurd scale of commercial academic publishing, which is a behemoth that controls indexing, controls databases, rankings, data analysis, a huge system with control, colonial, financial, and political control over knowledge production, dissemination, over systems, over livelihoods, over whose voices are heard, and which community is prioritized. However, this is just a reflection or an expression of the colonial structures, capitalist mode of production. So what do we do? For us to grow beyond the margins to create a real community worthy of bringing benefit, we need to take a step, take back, take back some of those commercial gains. At the most radical point, we need to dismantle the academic publishing system entirely, remove all commercial motivation, indigenize and transform the model from one run on cooperative community lines and not in the interests of shareholders and directors. Can we do that? Can we even take some of the steps necessary for wholesale transformation, like coordinated boycotts, mass refusals of payment, publishing only where our communities demand? At the start, we could revisit and take cues from those strategies from 2017, such as the one developed by David Lewis, the 2.5% commitment. I don't even know if people remember that or were aware of it at the time. And the circle, um, which like, the, like um, David Lewis's commitment, is all about taking that money that's already been consumed by publishers and turned into profit and investing in uh, a system which benefits everyone. From there, we can make bold and courageous decisions and to do so together in partnership with other institutions. If, like David Lewis says, if they choose, if they're willing to step up, we could and must invest in our open infrastructure in meaningful, committed ways which prioritize them and their longevity of a subscription of subscriptions and public publications like and, and deals by RMP, the latter of which do nothing but further inequality. We could move from serving the needs of the individual to those of the collective. We live in drastic times. We can no longer afford to fiddle at the margins, whether that means turning away from genocide in Israel and Palestine and climate breakdown, all the privilege we hold in wealthy countries that enables the entrenchment of a Western-centric colonial system of knowledge extraction and commodification. By redirecting investment into building a sustainable, equitable, and culturally informed shared open infrastructure and service, 
we can empower and send the community. And in Aotearoa, this can be understood as taking steps towards honoring fertility or watangi and the possibility of manamotahapi or self-determination in the publishing process. We have to ask ourselves, even in the realms of open access and scholarly communications, what kind of a world we want to live in. And then we have to make that world real. Kia ora. Thank you, Ludman. Um, the next speaker is Tracy Quay, Manager of Academic Journal at the Queensland University of Technology. Tracy, please. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm joining the panel today from the unceded lands of the Turrbal and Yagara here in Mangin, Brisbane, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, laws and customs spirits. So I also wanted to share with you today um, the slide that we use in our new community of practice here in Australia around Diamond Journal Publishing. Um, it's great to follow Reggie and Luckman um, in really setting the scene for what is social justice ethos about Diamond Publishing. Um, um, this is a brand new initiative here in Australia to bring together those of us actually working with Diamond Journals. Um, and I'm sharing the slide with you today because um, we're, we're all very much around the importance of community controlled academic publishing and obviously the mutual respect um, and inclusion and collaboration as part of that um, and all, the, all our own individual academic endeavours. So before I talk about this new Diamond Journal publishing community of practice, I, I sort of want to set some context in terms of what we know is happening in, in, journal, in Diamond Journal publishing. And a disclaimer that I am absolutely no expert at all, but because I've been working with Diamond Journals for quite a while now, um, this was this what's come up on my, on my own radar. And when I look um, for information, for example, about Diamond Journal publishing, it all comes from Europe. Um, it's, I think it's safe to say that there is a high level of collaborative initiatives, projects, activities happening internationally. Um, and I've just added a couple there. I think in the last five years in particular, we're starting to see a real joined up approach to do Diamond Journal publishing. So for example, back in 2020, there was the first International Diamond Journal um, publishing survey and that was conducted by Science Europe and Coalition S. They released a report in 2021 um, and an action plan was actually released in 2022 and, and at that stage they looked across around it was over 10,000 diamond journals and of that probably only around 90 not to 95 were from Australia and New Zealand so yes we're small fish in a very big pond. Um, this time last year, we actually saw the inaugural Global Summit on Diamond Open Access, and that brought together around 700 delegates. That was held, held in, in Mexico, um, and that's on again this year. Um, and Reggie will be involved in that as well. That's um, being held in South Africa uh, in early December, I think. Um, and I guess a couple of months ago, we saw Dymus and they did a soft launch of their Capacity Hub, which is a project that's aimed at joining up and aligning all these different European initiatives in, in, Diamond, in Diamond Publishing. But what's happening in Australia? Well, we know that we are publishing with a moderate level of publishing activity that's been going on for decades now. Um, Back in 2022, Open Access Australasia released an excellent report and it was really a snapshot of what was happening in terms of open access practice in Australia and New Zealand. And they looked across different institutions, mainly universities. In that report, we can see that around 31 of the 56 universities across Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand, have actually, um, are actually supporting and publishing open journals. Um, we also know that the Directory of Open Access Journal, which is the largest indexer of open access journals, 
um, has around 142 journals from Australia and around half of them are Diamond. And in our own context, we've been very lucky in the last couple of years. So those of us working in the open access space to be involved in a, in a broader open access community of practice. Um, but as Diamond Journal practitioners, we have no formal body or project or initiative um, that just looks at it the specific issues around Diamond Journal, journals which um, obviously Richie and Ella have, have detailed. So how did we get here with the community of practice? Um, so this time last year, we actually had a panel um, for a part, as part of Open Access Australasia that looked at the sustainability of journals. We had Sean Olm, he's from the ARC Centre of Excellence. Uh, we were really lucky to have Johan Rurik from Coalition S, uh, Ariana Becquerel garcia she joined the um, panel. She's actually one of the authors of the, the big international survey that was done a number of years ago, and she's heavily involved in, in the Global Summit as well. And we also had Donna Coventry, who works with Luckman at AUT uh, um, and to, uh, as part of Tawera. What we did in that session is um, we had breakout rooms and we talked a lot um, with, it, with the others about um, the main issues for us in Diamond Publishing, which is what infrastructure are we using, how are we using it, sustainability, credibility and discoverability. So what came out of that um, for all of us was this really overwhelming desire to have some sort of forum um, that was unique for, for those of us working in this space. Um, and that's how the community of practice came about. Um, we're part of a, we're a subgroup. So we're part of a broader Australian scholarly communications um, community of practice, which means meets month monthly. I've been very lucky this year to co-convene that this group um, with two um, open access rock stars, Zach Kendall from the University of, of um, Melbourne and Lauren from Deakin. Um, Lauren's actually responsible for these beautiful slide template that we, we use, we actually use this in, in our community. So that overarching um, collaboration that we have um, for the community is really from Open Access Australasia, our Council of Australian University Libraries and Creative Commons Australia. So this is just a little bit about what we do. Um, our membership uh, is quite small. We have around probably 45 on our uh, email list. We usually get 20 to 30 for the, the community events that we've had to date. Um, it really is just a space for us to share what we're doing, to share best practice, um, and we try to address different themes in Diamond Publishing. Um, we have special presenters come along and do like a lightning talk and things like that. What we really want to do um, at some stage is actually be a more active body in terms of advocacy for Diamond Journals. So the very first thing we did in our first meeting is we had a jam board session and we actually pretty much, we asked our, our members a couple of questions, but um, at the centre of that, we asked them what were the key issues that kept them up at night in terms of Diamond Publishing. Um, and what did they want to explore as a community? And you can see the range of responses um, are not just around Diamond Journals, it's around journal publishing um, as it is now, and especially open access publishing in Australia. So what we did with all those themes um, is we, we sort of grouped them and we, and we asked our community um, what they wanted. And, and I think really what we want to do is we want to try and get through as many of these issues and talk about them as a group as we can. Our very first meeting was we were very lucky. Open Access Australasia hosted a webinar from um, Directory of Open Access Journals. We had Joanna Ball, who's the Managing Director, and Juan Reef, who's the Indonesian Ambassador for DOAJ. They talked to us um, specifically about indexing um, and Donna um, joined us from AUT, it was great. She talked to us about um, discoverability in terms of diamond journals. We also, um, one of our meetings was, uh, we, we had a specific focus on the different publishing platforms we're using. Most of us are using open source um, and also different um, repositories we're using to publish. We were joined by, we we're lucky to be joined by Caitlin Savage from Deakin. Our last meeting, which was last week, um, we talked, and the theme really was around sustainability and funding. 
and we had Hamal Jamali join us. He's actually an information scientist from Charles Sturt himself and Simon Wakeling are doing a lot of research um, around open science, about measuring research. A couple of years ago, they did some significant work about looking at the state of journal publishing, not just open access publishing, journal publishing. Um, in Australia, and they're seeing a steep decline. So it was great to have me talk to us about the, the publishing landscape as well. Um, and we've got plans for our last meeting um, this later on this year. So as I said, um, we're a small group. We meet bi-monthly, um, one hour on Zoom, um, and we do try and make it about the community. It's what the community want to talk about. We treat it as a safe space. Um, we have had a little bit of interest outside of Australia for people wanting to join the community. We are trying to keep it regional. We do have our New Zealand colleagues, um, which always adds so much um, to what we're doing. I was trying to think about the theme for today, which was Communities in Action um, and this initiative, which is so so new and young. Um, and I guess what we what we really want to do is um, instead of thinking about what our international counterparts are doing, we want to try and create something of our own here um, in Australia. So just being part of the panel today, it's been great to, to share that information about the community itself. Um, we've put a little blog post together. I guess our collaboration with DOAJ early on has really helped. They're very interested in what we're doing now in Australia. So we're doing a blog post um, to talk about um, this community and how we got here. And also we've been able to um, collaboration with our New Zealand people has been fantastic. So we've written a paper with Donna and Janet. Um, we're going to talk about the state of diamond um, in our own institutions and present that at the OE Global Conference later this year. And just very finally, I wanted to thank, um, I think it was yesterday, in yesterday's session, we had Mace from UCS and she was talking about how challenging it is to build these communities and it is so, and we can't do it without um, that overarching support from Open Access Australasia, from Call, from Creative Commons Australia, obviously the, the general, the big community of practice that we hear and also our members, so our, our members make it. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Casey. Um, the last two speakers are Lindo Hosten, faculty member, faculty librarian of Charleston University and Koichi Inulu for um, research service librarian at the Victoria University of Wellington. Um, Lindo and Koichi, please. Yeah, I'm gonna just share screen first and then... So, right. Do you want to introduce yourself first, Lindo? No, you go, Koichi. Right. Uh, kia ora te whanau, um, tona te hapani te iwi, ko Fuji, te maunga, uh, ko Tsurumi te awa, uh, ko Koichi no e tōku ingoa. Uh, hey, research services live and how kite pataka korero. No reira tena koto katoa. So my name is Koichi Noe. I'm a research services library at uh, Victoria University of Wellington. Um, now, would you like to introduce yourself, Lindol? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Lindol. I'm joining you from Wiradjuri country in regional New South Wales today. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I live and work. So as Lily said, I'm a faculty librarian at Charles Sturt University, but before that I worked at Massey University in Aotearoa. And I was part of the open access ROPU or group, which is why I'm here today. So today we want to give you an overview of the open access toolkit um, that we made. So Koichi will take you through what we made and where you can access it. And then I'll take you through how this resource came to be. So I'll give back to Koichi for a few moments. Awesome. Thank you, Lindell. Um, so a bit of a change of topic, but like we are sort of presenting on the um, publishing support tool uh, 
in general. So yeah, so we are going to start with what we created and then Linda is going to talk about how we created. So what we did, um, it's a guide to publishing open access covering five stages of publishing. These are now there in New Zealand specific context, context and perspective, um, which I'm going to share soon. And there's a template so it can be adapted openly available under CC by SA license hosted by Open Access Social Asia. So uh, to your right, uh, you'll see the five stages and planning. Uh, well, there are many ways to um, sort of like divide publishing cycle, but we wanted to keep it simple and then easy to remember uh, from a researcher's perspective. So first, uh, you know, researchers have to plan <clears throat> and second, they have to choose a journal. And third, they have to submit manuscript for hopefully accepted. And fifth uh, is like, ah, yeah, after publication. So that's how we divide it and the, um, the publication workflow. <clears throat> so I'm going to just sort of get out of this uh, slide and then go live. Um, are you looking at uh, my yep. brother? Is that right? Thank you. So, um, well, as you know, like Open Access Social Asia has a resources page. This is where our Open Access Toolkit uh, sits. So you can just click and then, well, I'll just click actually. <clears throat> and there are some uh, primers and then, but basically you just scroll down to uh, whatever version you want to download. So, uh, well, of course we kept uh, researchers needs in mind, but also we, you know, sort of about, you know, um, us librarians as well. So we want to just make it easy for us to um, sort of share the knowledge with the researchers. So one, uh, the first one is institution neutral uh, infographic. So you can just download and take it to workshop or somewhere and then distribute it easily without doing anything much. And then also we have an accessible version. So that's like a screen friendly reader uh, for people with uh, uh, reading di uh, disabilities. And then so also templates, uh, that's what I'm going to show in a minute, uh, in created by Canva. So um, once you download it, you can open it in Canva. And I guess like uh, like many other resources in Open Access also Asia, it's created on that. And I'm, I'm guessing you have a free account. <clears throat> and then you can just see easily, uh, modify and we also um, added uh, 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 things you need to change in red font so you don't miss. <laughs> and then you can just add your institution logo and all those things. I'm going to just quickly um, give you the uh, tour to the toolkit. So each stage has exactly the same format. So this is stage one, uh, planning. And at the top, this is the part we call infographic, but basically uh, here we present questions um, researchers need to con consider at each stage. And then uh, if, cannot, uh, uh, if they cannot answer this question themselves, we sort of direct them to um, institution specific resources where they can find the answers. And if they cannot still find the answer, they can just you know get further help down the road. Uh, so this is the, the gist of it. Uh, you can just, uh, again, edit this bit with uh, 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 resources specific to the institution. And to your left, uh, the bottom left, you see tips and tricks. And that's like a sort of pro tips. Uh, so we worked as a group, like all the librarians from all the universities in New Zealand, and we all have some sort of uh, queries um, that keep coming back to us. And then also we have to just sort of, sort of like uh, uh, give them advice. So these are the sort of, sort of collection of uh, advices we uh, gave to researchers uh, in the past. And then so they don't have to ask um, <laughs> the same question again, again. And to your uh, right, uh, you see checklists. So they can just tick, tick, tick the boxes once they are uh, uh, able to do that, they are ready to move on to the next. So as you can see, this is like sort of self 
self-service, um, self-contained resource. So like we, we don't, basically uh, we want researchers to be able to publish open access uh, independently, although we're happy to be contacted at any point. So that's what we created. And then um, each university in Aotearoa um, adapted the template and created their own. I should probably get back to um, the slide and I'll show you um, adaptation from University of Waikato. So yes, the contents uh, more or less the same, but uh, the layout is different, color schemes different. They are quite creative bunch of people there. Um, I love the color, um, but yes, um, we are hoping that uh, our you know our Australian colleagues can adopt these uh, resources as well. Would you like to move on? Um, sure. Yeah. Thank you. So on top of making a pretty cool resource, um, there has been a few other tangible outcomes from this project. So the toolkit is the second most accessed page on the Open Access Australasia website and um, accounts for about 57% of all downloads on the website to date. We realised during our research um, and reconnaissance that the New Zealand Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, MB, wasn't listed on Sherpa services, so we reached out to them and um, they're now listed. For those of you who aren't familiar with MB, they introduced an open research policy in late 2022. And we've delivered um, three presentations now with more to come on various aspects of the toolkit and its inception. Next slide, please. Thanks, Koichi. Oh, no. Yep. Um, so Koichi's already uh, stolen my thunder and said that we are a group made up of at least one representative from every university in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And as you can see here, that's um, almost spans the length of the country. We had two project leads and project oversight came via Universities New Zealand Open Access Steering Group via CONSUL, which is the Council of New Zealand University Libraries. We started in May uh, and finished in the same in December the same year, so 2023. And even though we're all from different universities, a lot of us had worked together before. So um, there's a really strong open access community of practice or communities of practice in Aotearoa. Uh, quite a few of us had worked on various versions of the state of open access in Aotearoa, which kicked off around 2017. And shout out to Lookman, who was on um, that original group. And we've also been involved in different um, open, access, open access events just like this one. Next slide, please, Koichi. So we met fortnightly and we spent quite a bit of time at the beginning getting to know each other and then also collectively auditing, reviewing and critiquing our joint resources so that we could identify knowledge and resource gaps. And then we split off into subgroups. So some of us went and did proofreading, some of us went and did some extra research and others joined the sort of research side of things. We used Miro, Canva and Zoom. And I think thanks to COVID, we're all far more comfortable with that kind of teamwork. We never met face to face during the duration of the project. We did try Teams originally, but it wasn't quite up to that level of cross-institutional sharing at that point. Next slide, thanks Koichi. Um, so there were some limitations. We early on had to go back to our project oversight and get some clarifications. So we did focus on journals. As I've said, we were all on different platforms and systems. So that did cause a few little teething problems at the beginning. Um, and finding researchers to feed back, as I'm sure you're all aware, can be difficult. They're very time poor. So right at the beginning, we um, decided that rights retention and research data management were out of the scope of this piece of work, but there is room for them um, down the track. So moving forward, thanks Koichi. Um, the ROPU has set up ongoing meetings to ensure that the toolkit does remain up to date and there could be room for other toolkits as I've just touched on, depending on the direction that Consul and Universities New Zealand, New Zealand want to take. And we'd like to leave you with a call to action. So we acknowledge that the chances of every university in Australia coming together to do something like this is slim. Um, but let's face it, it probably wouldn't work with a much larger group. I think the, the size of our group was really ideal in our success. 
So our challenge to you is to go and find a community that makes sense to you and use the toolkit as a template to create something similar. So this could be the group of eight. It could be the regional universities network. It could be universities that teach vet science or social work, or um, I'd really like to poke the stick and say open access for non-traditional research outputs. Mm -hmm. So that's what we'd like to leave you with. We really want to see what you can come up with based on our model. Thank you, Lindo and Koichi. Um, the next session is panel discussion, and I will pass over to Janet and five speaker for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Lily, and thank you, everybody, for um, such informative work that you're all doing. It's, it's, um, we've covered a lot of ground and a lot of initiatives in, in the last half an hour, and uh, it's been really impressive to get everyone together and uh, and talk about the issues and what everybody's doing. So thank you very much for that. And um, what we're gonna do now is we have a prepared question each for each of our panelists. We are gonna have to ask our panelists to be quite brief because we have run a little bit over time and we do want to have some time at the end to take questions from the audience. So I'm gonna start off, uh, I'm gonna ask a question of Reggie. And that question is, uh, Reggie, could you talk about how your definition of diamond open access translates to the African platform for open scholarship? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Janice. And uh, I promise I'll try to be as quick as possible. So I am going to skip a couple of slides. So yeah, I, I think... Um, and and this maybe pull develops from some of the what the colleagues had said. What we have done at the University of Cape Town for Africa was we developed what we call the African platform for open scholarship. Uh, APOS was conceptualized, developed, and rolled out for the publication of both books and journals, and the primary goal was to improve dissemination of African scholarship. Uh, the important thing we, we, we was one needs to note that the platform adopts the tenant model, and that is groups of institutions share the common uh, access with the specific with specific uh, 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 privileges to the software instance. In in our case, it is uh, the PKP product, which is OGS and OMP. What's important to note is that. The model, the tenant model, is based on offering each participating institution the opportunity to retain their identity. And as you could see, these are solutions. Nowhere can you see that they are located at UCT. It is each institution representing itself. Okay. The, the, the participating institutions use the same uh, common base for the platform, but the look and feel of its journals or books will be reflective of the institution. Um, we also like the participating institutions to take ownership. If you want to grow African scholarship, you need to take ownership of their segment within the platform while showcasing the research productivity. And in this way, we feel that the prestige of the institution is enhanced. It's not about the platform being announced, but the prestige of the institution. The only prescription for participation is that all content is available pre, uh, free to the end user and that there are no author charges. Um, and in this way, we ensure that we can um, uh, 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 determine quality content. Um, I'm going to briefly take um, the UCT program to illustrate how the academy can take back its scholarship. This again, going back to relating to my comments earlier on and how the library can provide the necessary support in the process. So if you look at the graphic, um, you could see how much the institution is already paying for and 
how little the publishers are doing to earn all those subscription monies. We have taken 28 books. Uh, we have published 28 books and we've published six journals. We've, we've analyzed 10 of those books and albeit very superficially. And as you could see from, from the graph here, if you look at the market and constitutional law uh, books, you could see the number of downloads. Sorry, I am going as fast as I can and I apologize if it's a bit too fast, okay? Um, we took a deeper dive uh, in terms of the two books and one is the marketing of South Af uh, marketing to South African consumers. And the second one was constitutional for law, a uh, constitutional law for students. Note that these are very South African based books. Um, the marketing book was downloaded 73,514 times in one year. In 12 months, it has 73, more than 73,000 downloads. The constitution law book was downloaded more than 71, almost 72,000 times uh, in the year. Since its publication, and this is the constitutional law textbook, since its publication in March 2020 to July 2024, the constitutional law textbook was downloaded 245,000 times from more than 160 countries across the world. Um, and, okay. Rather quickly again, uh, we published, uh, we're publishing six journals. And two of the journals are, 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 are displayed here. The first is the Journal of African Real Estate Research. And this journal has received 60,000 downloads from 161 countries. And the second one is the Journal of Construction, Business and Management. And this journal, has had 75,000 downloads from 172 countries with significant interest from India, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, and UK. Uh, so publishing on the platform ensures international reach with Diamond Open Access freely um, sharing African scholarship. You could see the, the, the reach that we've had and the impact that we've had. So in summation, just to relate this back to what I initially said, have we contributed to the, to the bi-directional flow of information? Yes. Is it free to the reader, free to author? Yes. Is the academy taking back um, uh, 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 the, its scholarship? Yes. Are we inclusive and equitable? Yes. Are we advancing decolonization, demarginalization? Yes. Non-commercial? driven by social justice principles, and we're ensuring the, the, the shift is, is between, uh, the shift in knowledge colonialism is being destabilized. Thanks, Janet. Thank you, Reggie, that was great. Um, now, I would like to shift to Ota Lukman uh, with a question. Um, we actually had a couple for you, Lukman. We might only have time to ask you one. Um, I'd like to ask you to speak to in what ways can Diamond Open Access Publishing create more inclusive spaces for diverse voices and perspectives in research? And I think in many ways, what Rich has just been talking about are some of the ways in which diverse voices can be represented because when you set about creating a sort of shared open infrastructure which is something we're aspiring to do here in Aotearoa um, with real investment that takes the the labor away from editors and give, frees up the opportunity for them to to do the important work if you like the editorial work then it opens up opportunities for growth and for inclusion um, but it takes, as I was saying earlier, a lot of courage to do that. Um, and I think without our journals, with the interviews that we did with our editors, what we really discovered was there is a huge amount of 
part of Ha. There's a huge amount of love that goes into the work that they do um, and the way in which they run their journals. And that's not out of any intention from us. That's that's purely from the editors themselves and the ethos with which they run their publications. Um, they're very inclusive and they're naturally diverse and they want to decolonize the system that they're working in. And, and they make those steps to, towards doing that by encouraging uh, diverse kinds of submissions uh, and different and submissions in different formats um, and engendering conversation with uh, the community themselves. So whether that's practitioners or um, other communities that the different publications um, are targeted at or in com are in um, discourse with, um, you know, it, in its essence, it's really a challenge to the traditional sort of idea of Western academic scholarship. And I think that's those are the opportunities that Diamond Open Access provide us. Um, but it really requires that investment for this to 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 be sustainable and for it to be successful um, and equitable. Um, you know, Diamond Open Access, if it's done right, can op open up the possibilities for multiple languages. Um, and our editors talk a lot about mentoring the um, early career or postgrad researchers who's, who make submissions to their journals. Um, they talk about creating safe spaces and um, guiding people through the process, giving opportunity for early publications. Um, and yeah, pretty much just forging a different kind of um, discourse, I'd say, if that answers the question. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Lukman. Um, I'm going to go over to Tracy now with a question. Um, so how can the Australasian diamond community of practices experience with implementing open knowledge initiatives inform other communities? So in other words, what are the best practices, challenges, successes that you can share with those to help others promote collaboration, inclusivity and accessibility in their own projects? Thanks, Jenny. So we've only been a community for 10 months, but, and I think we were very keen, um, particularly in the beginning, to bring together those of us who are really just working with, with Diamond Journals. But I think what's been a real benefit is to actually include people in the community who are on the periphery for us. Um, and I think that's I'm going to go back to having Hamid Jamali on, on our one of our community meetings last week. Um, so he's a former editor. He's been on and he's on editorial board. So now he's researching in that space. And it's really interesting to hear his perspective. So he's got a broader knowledge of the publishing landscape. Um, so not just open access, but that's really important to hear that as well. I know from my own experience with the community of practice that we had here early on at CUNY, QUT, initially we just talked amongst ourselves so our, the journal managers would get together and we'd be using the open source OJS and we were trying to figure out how to use it and we would share practice. And then we brought in the experts, we brought in some librarians, so we brought some copyright people in to help us understand Creative Commons, uh, Metrics Librarian to help us understand what's what the value of the citations, uh, things like that. Scholarly Comms Librarian, obviously vital. Um, and then we brought in the IT staff, so those staff who were supporting the software, that, the infrastructure for our journals, and I actually think it was more valuable for them to see what we were doing. So bringing in other voices into your community of practice is really important. Um, I think that's from, I guess that's my perspective, that's what we hope for this community uh, of Diamond Journal Publishers in Australia, that we can get as much information, um, and also it's reciprocal, so having DOJ as a part of that process as well, they starting to understand what's happening down our end, and it's, it's just creating linkages and collaboration, that level of collaboration is really important. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and of course, I think we've already mentioned that this, the Diamond Group actually grew out of an event that was held at Open Access Week in 2023. So it's really good to get uh, to revisit what has happened uh, in the time since 
Um, I'd now like to go to uh, Lyndall and ask, um, could you elaborate a little bit on the co collaborative process involved in the creation of the open access toolkit? Thanks, Janet. I think, um, like I said, the, we already had some fairly strong pre-existing relationships, which really helped. Um, but also having the dedicated project leads really helped as well. Um, so the initial meetings were all really well planned out. We spent the first whole meeting getting to know each other and, you know, getting comfortable in our space. We were always given a chance to catch up. Um, and there was lots of flexibility and understanding uh, about our workloads outside of the project and what was going on in the space in universities in New Zealand at the time. Um, on top of, you know, we used Miro, which was a fantastic tool. I'd never used it before that, but I will strongly advocate to use it. It's a, it was a really perfect tool for what we did. Um, Canva and um, yeah, Teams and Zoom. Teams wasn't so great, but anyone that uses Teams can relate to that, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey, thank you. And um, a question for Koichi as well on the toolkit. Um, what specific impact has the Open Access Toolkit had on promoting open knowledge within the academic community? Okay, um, that's a hard question. <laughs> it's very hard to pinpoint the specific impact of the toolkit because there are other tools available, like uh, Open Access Repository and Open General System, all the other things. Uh, we promote and then you know provide support for. Um, so yeah, we cannot claim all the <clears throat> let's say, oh wow, well, we have you know increased um number of open access publications in this country because <laughs> uh, because of the toolkit. <clears throat> but um, having said that, uh, um, uh, we're going to have a you know six months review, and as a project team, Ropu, we could think about like how. We we can just like attract the impact of that that toolkit. Mm, personally, I'd like to interview uh, some academics. I actually handed over, handed the toolkits to, and then see if they used it, or if we, they use like uh, um, how they use it, how helpful it was, or is there any changes they want us to make? That's still part of the conversation. Um, so yes, um, I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly, but like, yeah, that's where we are at. Um, anecdotally, yes, we've been, you know, circulating the toolkit to every, at every opportunity we get. And then, so, and then as uh, Lindo showed in the slides, then yeah, it seems like downloads counts, uh, you know, really good. So yeah. That's all you know, I have to say at the moment. Thank yeah, you. thank you. I, I think keeping the, the second most visited page for almost a year on the Open Access Australasia website is a, a, a testimony to the fact that it is definitely being, being used and appreciated. Um, at this point, I would like to welcome Lily um, back to the microphone. Uh, we have some questions in the Slido from the audience. And um, Lily's going to take over and uh, ask these to the panelists. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Janet. So um, I have three questions from the audience. So I will go through it one by one to, um, to our speaker. The first question is, how do we advocate our diamond journal in this part of the world? Radical ideas are welcome. Who will answer this question? Uh, I'll just get everyone started. I think we need a lot of myth busting around open access, especially diamond journals, um, because they are free, free to access and free to publish in. And there's a lot of misconceptions around diamond journals that they're not quality. Um, so you start with the small things. Uh, we talk about you know how your citations will increase. So it's having conversations with other people around what diamond is and what it's not. Um, and I think that happens when you start to build relationships with other groups. Um, 
where I am here in QUT and our team, we deal specifically with research students and staff um, and we sort of embed discussions around open access as widely as we can. We point them to, um, so it's the small things um, that we do. Uh, and I know that's not radical, um, but it's just sort of, it's an awareness raising activity more than anything. Um, you know, to point people to to alternate ways of publishing um, that when they get there, they're not actually alternate. They're better ways of publishing. Any mm -hmm. further comment, Wachi? Can I can I make a comment? Okay, and the thing is, um, we need as librarians to reconceptualize collection development. Because mm. currently our practice is that we collect from the outside through those mm. subscriptions for the inside, okay, for our research communities. But the content is developed from the research communities itself. So we should flip from collecting from the outside for the inside to collecting from the inside for the outside. So mm -hmm. as librarians, we need to reconceptualize this whole collection development process. Mm. It's interesting to see, Reggie, what's happened in the Netherlands. So their version of, of um, well, our version is the ARC, which funds research. It's now in the Netherlands, they've actually announced they will subsidised um, journal publishers who aren't necessarily diamond, but they've got a paid version of open access to, to actually flip their journals. So their government and their taxpayers are actually funding um, people to flip journals to diamond. I mean, that's an amazing incentive. Um, I, I don't know if, if it could happen here, but it's always good to see what the Netherlands is doing in this space. Mm. I must just say that, sorry, sorry, Lou. I think we as librarians, we have the power to start to initiate these kinds of discussions. And I mean, for me, it's irrational in terms of current practices where 90% of the work is already paid for by our institutions. And we mm. buy back that which has already been paid for. And we have been be, we have been accomplices to this irrational behavior. And we need to change it. It's only us that can change it. I agree. Mm. And I would I would add that I think what advocacy needs is real leadership and strong leadership. I think we need messages from the organizations and associations that our libraries um, belong to. Um, and um, do, how often do we see call, for example, championing diamond open access as a priority? Um, we spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of money on read and publish deals, which just entrench and you know ex exacerbate a really bad situation. So I think while we can make little steps, we can do all the things like Tracy was just describing, we can run workshops, we can find our champions amongst our researchers and get them to share the messages. What we really need is proper leadership. You know, when I talk to the DVC, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research in this institution, he's very sympathetic to the whole idea of non-APC um, open access. But he doesn't have a vested interest anymore because he does he's not a publishing academic in the way that so many are but you need to find the people who are going to make a big difference structurally and they're the people you need on your side when you're advocating plus we need our associations to back this message wholeheartedly that's a wonderful idea how about lindo and koichi do you have further comment uh just like a more light-hearted approach, but it's generally speaking, uh, we need to raise awareness among the academics that um, diamond journals such as diamond journals exist, and then we have a platform that they can use. And it's just yeah, 
I was just thinking like some kind of fanzines about diamond journals, just like, you know, print something out and just leave it in the staff kitchen. Like that's sort of like a sort of casual approach as well. Cause like I do pick up and read, um, for example, student magazines, if they are sitting in the kitchen. Same, like we do commit, try to communicate through official channels, but if it does, it's not working, why not fanzines? Just make it a little bit more fun, pick it up and then pros and cons and then what they can actually do with their own journals that they can run, you know, free of charge, that sort of thing. But that's just an idea, but um, see how it goes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do we help shift the behavior of the researcher who want to publish in Diamond Journal rather than the established publisher journal and we do that dominant? Who would like to start first? Richie? Look, I, I think... Um... Academics are, are, are suspicious uh, about the quality. And I personally have a huge problem in terms of defining quality. What is quality? Mm. Okay, And I think against whose standards does one benchmark in terms of quality? But I think um, at the University of Cape Town, I'll give that as, a, as an example. Um, there is a push to publishing Diamond for a couple of reasons. One is that you're not paying article processing charges, nor are you paying book processing charges, right? And given the fact that it is open, um, it solicits uh, 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 um, citations much faster than the traditional publishing. And, cool. and if you look at one, look, I am a rated researcher in terms of the South African system. And I get about 50,000 rands from the South African government. That, that doesn't even cover the cost of one APC. So those are the challenges. And I think what we need to showcase is that if your work is available for free, it will solicit citations because that is what academics want. They want the work to be read. Mm -hmm. So I think that is what we need to hone in on. The depth which open brings, and especially Diamond because it's free. The work is done by yourself as an author your peer review, the peer review, that's also done for free. So, yeah. I'll just highlight a comment in the chat from Garth, which absolutely nails it for me. You know, we do so much um, talking about this, which is internal, which is like amongst peers, which is all very comfortable. Um, you know, <laughs> how much does the taxpayer, the people who are, who are funding research get to say, where research gets disseminated and how, how much are they involved in the process of, of um, being impacted by that uh, or, or feeling the benefit of that? Um, we, we don't consider uh, where the money is coming from when it is being spent on, on publishing in research. We just, we just, as libraries in particular, we just spend a lot of money. We don't think about it in terms of investment and careful management of of taxpayer funds which is essentially what it's about if you you know if you pair it right back it's just a thought how about tracy lindo and koichi do you have other thoughts i was also thinking about um our academics i mean going back to inside the institution many of our academics are reviewers for um especially our senior academics and reviewers for for really high-end publications and 
I mean, as librarians, the more we can talk to them about what they're doing, which is um, yeah, doing work for free that um, publishing companies are making a lot of money out of. Um, and also, so I think that's conversations we can have. Totally, I agree with Luck. It's, it's, a, it's a, all about education outside of the institution as well. People understanding how publication works, how research works, um, but, and, but who at the end of the day is making money out of mm. Lindo and Koichi, do you have further comment? Yeah, it's just sometimes hard to balance their needs. So they, they, from uh, equity and uh, decolonization perspective, it's reasonably easy to get buy-ins from researchers. Yes, you know, we want to, uh, you know, be acknowledged for their, you know, free labor. They want to be, they, they want to, you know, gain back the control. Um, over their work and all those things. That's one thing. And the other is still in some disciplines, you know, they, they need to publish in, a, well, high impact journals uh, to get hired, to get promoted, all those things. So it is just, a, um, I guess like a university as a whole needs to start looking at the, their recruitment process or promotion process, you know. Not just like you know publishing those like uh, um, high end journal. I mean, it's yes that can be acknowledged, but at the same time, all this work they're putting into on the free open access uh, publishing platform should be acknowledged as important as the other you know type of publishing <laughs> that might change the you know behaviors of you know researchers in our community. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Lindo, do you have further comment? No, I just agree with pretty much mm. everything Tracy just said. And um, I see a comment from M in the in the chat about rights retention being the next frontier. Mm. And we've had three events at Charles Sturt this week on for Open Access Week, obviously, and rights retention's been asked about every day this week. So people are starting to think about it. Thank you. Um, I'm cautious about the time. Um, we may not have um time for it to um to discuss the other two questions. So um, but um, the audience, uh, if, if you have any question, uh, you can uh, always uh, well contact our speaker uh, after this meeting, this is webinar. So um, thank you all the presenter and uh, audience uh, attendance for this uh, webinar. I now pass it back to Janet. Thank you, Lily. Um, and thanks so much to all our amazing presenters. It's been a really, really good uh, good session. I've learned a lot and we've covered a lot of ground. I uh, really appreciate everybody. Uh, particular thanks to Reggie, who's joining us in the middle of the night from <laughs> Cape Town. Thank you, Reggie. And I saw in the chat that uh, we've had a lot of comments. People really appreciated you being here with us today and adding to the conversation. So um, all that's left to do now really is to thank our organizers of this session, uh, which was Sophie Baker, Lily Ho and Mark Sutherland. And uh, thank you all as well for coming. Um, the obligatory spruik of our last session for Open Access Week, which is tomorrow, same time, same place, um, when we'll be looking at communities contextualized. And yes, I'm pretty sure AI will come up at some point in that discussion. So I hope to see some of you there. And um, the only thing to do now is to pass back to Sophie, please, for the closing karakia. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Sophie. Kia whakaitea te tapu, kia waiatea ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai, haumie, huie, ai ki.